Good morning. Thank you for joining us today in lovely New York. I assume most of you got here yesterday in the downpour of, the, of a uh, Monday morning. Uh, I have to say it was quite awful walking from my hotel to the Javits Center yesterday and the pouring rain was not exactly what I was looking for. Um, but I'm very excited to be here today. My name is Vanessa Alvarez. I am the conference chair for Cloud Expo, the 14th Cloud Expo. Who would have thought back in, you know, so many years ago that cloud computing would be what it is today? Many of us thought that it was just a fad, a trend. But the reality is that cloud computing is here to stay. And in fact, in the next few days, you're gonna see tremendous sessions and an agenda that shows that cloud truly is here. Organizations are using it. And today, we're going into the next level of cloud. I'd like to bring up my team today because what you will see is that we brought together several areas. So if the team could come up. What we decided to do was bring together Cloud Expo, DevOps Summit, and the Internet of Things, an emerging category for us. So I will give the team a moment to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Larry Carvalho. I'm a research ma manager focused on platform as a service with IDC. Hi, my name is Andy Mann. I work with the Office of the Chief Technology Officer at CA Technologies. Hello, I'm Roger Struckoff. I run the Tau Institute for Global ICT Research. I'm the chair of Things Expo. Please visit us at track nine all week. <laughs> Give it to Roger for plugging his own uh, track. But the, the, clear, the, the clear example here is that we brought together Internet of Things and big data, cloud and DevOps, because these are fundamental to cloud computing. And as we start to move forward into this uh, into the space and into the industry, what we'll see is that all of these areas will converge and cloud will be a fundamental platform for that. Whether you're talking private, public, hybrid, whatever it may be, there's something for everyone. And enterprises today have to get on the bandwagon. In the next few days, you'll see sessions covering the Internet of Things, cloud, uh, enterprise stories, cloud adoption, DevOps, and the role that DevOps plays in not only cloud, but in big data as well, and how IT operations need to transform in order to be able to help their enterprises and their business move into the next era. Today, we have a stellar lineup of keynote speakers, and we're very excited to be presenting them this morning. Uh, we have first up, Stephen Martin, General Manager of Microsoft Azure. Microsoft today has an amazing platform in Azure, something that we will see in the next few days, uh, what it's become. Stephen Martin, please come up to the stage. Join me in welcoming Stephen Martin. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, so I, I want to start with a question. Uh, how many of you, when you woke up this morning and you hit the alarm clock and you hopped out of bed and you said, I can't wait to spend my day hearing from a whole bunch of vendors talk endlessly about their wares, to hear their offer about how it slices and it dices, and if I did anything other than go and sign up for their service today, it would just be a colossal mistake. How many people had that emotion when the alarm clock went off? Anybody? I had a strange feeling that that might be true. See me in the booth later. I'd be glad to talk to you. Uh, Microsoft has some amazing technologies, and we would be glad to talk to you about any and all of them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Come to the booth. We'll show you demos. We'll talk core technology. But rather than do that in this session, uh, what we thought we would do is talk about some big industry-level trends. Uh, how did we get to where we are today? What does the next five years look like? We actually think that we can learn a lot over the last five years that predict what is going to happen in the future. Uh, so we think an industry dialogue uh, talking about some big trends would be far more valuable for you guys uh, and, and, and likely help us come together and identify some things that we probably should be talking about uh, that we're currently not talking about. 
Um, over the course of the next few minutes, I'll also invite to the stage uh, Kareem uh, Lakani, who's a Harvard professor, uh, who's done, is a very well-cited uh, researcher on open source and economics that will help talk about all the value that customers are getting out of cloud technology generically. Who would have predicted? I think from time to time in our industry, it, it is so dynamic, it is so fluid, uh, it is so impactful, you have to hit pause and just look left or right. If, if we had a time machine, we could go back 10 years, and you could actually look at where we are today and, and list out some things that I'm about to, about to show. 10 years ago, you, you would have thought we were absolutely crazy. So let's just take a quick look. Number one, an e-tailer took the early lead in cloud computing. Who would have predicted that 10, 15 years ago? Some of the biggest enterprise IT players are largely on the sidelines currently. Largely on the sidelines. That doesn't mean that it's always going to be true, uh, but certainly true today. Uh, in just the last four years, prices have come down over 60 times, and that's just the top two cloud providers in the space. 60 times, and this is just the beginning. A lot of us got used to prices either holding the same or actually getting more expensive over time for the technology that we paid for, right? Um, this is clearly an area where the price is eroding and it's eroding really, really fast. Uh, and how about this one? Microsoft runs Linux, offers Oracle instances, SAP images, and partners with Salesforce. Take a look at this list. Just a few years ago, is this what anyone would have predicted? Hard to say. And I think the reason why it's important to have these little moments in time to take a hard look at this is to say technology by definition will be disruptive. There are actually three things in life that are absolutely certain. Death, taxes, and technology disruption. And it will happen again. And it will happen again, over and over and over again. And we're going to talk about that through the uh, presentation today. Uh, one of the more fascinating angles of uh, cloud technology, and I'm sure this is true for many of you as well, uh, is that we get a lot of real-time data about usage. Uh, we used to pay research firms and analysts tons and tons and tons of money to go out and tell us interesting things about how customers were using technology and do surveys and whatnot. Now what do we do? We just go look at the data. And it is amazing to be able to have this wealth of information right at our fingertips to understand what customers are actually doing, what offers are they taking advantage of, what services are they using, at what rate are these services getting real meaningful adoption, what parts of the world are doing interesting things at, at interesting moments. And because of that, we're able to get much better insights into the technology that's being used, and we can share some of that information back. It helps us build much, much better products. Uh, so, it, no cloud talk would be uh, complete without uh, you know, some, some interesting statistics. So here are a few. Uh, the top two cloud providers in the space deliver more x86 server capacity than the planet used in 2007. 2007, not that long ago. I'm not talking 20 years ago, right, where we're making a bunch of trade-offs on clock speeds and advancements, but just seven years ago. So more server capacity delivered by, a by two cloud providers than the planet used in 2007. More data is stored in a single Microsoft data center than has been physically written in human history. And that's true for us, but that's actually true for lots of other folks as well, right? Uh, and the amount of data that we're seeing being ingested just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I, I would ask you, think to yourself, what did big data mean to you three, four, five years ago? And what does it mean today? Uh, well, for us, it's very different. You know, when we talk about big data today, we're talking about petabytes being ingested every single day from single sources, petabytes, uh, bordering on exabytes of data from single customers, right? Very, very large, and that number will just continue to go up. Here's an interesting one. IT budgets keep, are keeping up roughly with inflation. Incidentally, if anyone ever wants to do, what's the best correlative to uh, IT budgets over time? GDP. GDP and IT budgets correlate at 0.96, right? So in general, IT budgets are moving up by about the rate of inflation to uh, about 3 4% of uh, a year. Uh, compute, on the other hand, demand is doubling, more than doubling every single year. These two things don't quite land together. Um, and so part of what we realize is that the cloud is as much an economic solution as it is a technology solution. Um, in fact, IT has, has largely used cloud technology because there wasn't a lot of other alternative. It was pragmatic uh, as much as it was strategic. 
So how did we get here? How did we get to this place that we are, Cloud Expo, in 2014? The 14th one is it started in 2007. It's easy when we go back to use 2002 as an interesting moment in time. We were clearly past the dot-com bubble. Uh, we were solidly into cleanup mode, um, and we'd kind of return to you know more typical, more typical patterns. But there were some interesting things that happened from '98 to 2002 that really shaped the future for cloud computing. Uh, incidentally, uh, there are references to cloud computing going back to the '90s, to the '80s, to the '70s. In fact, the first reference we could find goes back to the 1960s where a professor talked about having 15 data centers across the world with compute power that was shared and accessed by enterprise organizations all over the planet in the, in the, in the, early, in the early 60s. So let's go back prior to 2002. Uh, right around that time from 98 to 2002, we saw the rise of uh, application service providers. Uh, they came onto the scene very, very, very aggressive. There were a bunch of them. Some I had a bunch of colleagues from when I went, uh, was working at Netscape that went to places like LoudCloud uh, and were very, very deeply invested in that space. Uh, co-location providers also got very, very big at that time. One of the issues was the majority of the install base, the majority of the customers from the application service providers in those early colos were startups themselves. Right, so you had startups that were feeding startups, which ultimately had some significant problems at the end of the dot-com bubble. But with regard to the modern enterprise, or the, the, the typical enterprise organization, the vast majority of the resources were managed in-house. Right? Uh, you go back and you look at studies, and they'll all tell you the same thing. There was very high preference for data, for applications to run inside the four walls of the business. There was very, very, very little appetite to run uh, anything outside of your organization. I had some fascinating conversations with customers in early 2000 uh, where they would say things like, I will never consider cloud computing. I won't consider outsourcing. I won't move anything outside more for my four walls. Uh, it's like, well, that's interesting. Let's talk about that. Who do you use for payroll? They say ADP. I'm like, OK. Uh, so all of your employee information, their social security numbers, their healthcare records, their personal addresses, all of that lives outside your four walls. Like, you, and so getting people over the initial reality that they had already outsourced some of their most significant pieces of information was new. They hadn't thought about it through that lens. A virtualization rate at this point was really low, right? It was under, under 5%. Uh, we were still in very much a mo model where when you had a new application, you bought a new set of servers and customers were just continuing to add and add and add to their data centers. We knew that wouldn't scale forever, uh, but we hadn't really reached the explosion of applications that was going to hit in the next few years. Servers were purchased and deployed uh, on premises. There was some outsourcing that was done, particularly in Europe, but by and large, customers had their bulk of their IT on servers, on premises, inside their four walls. A little bit of virtual, uh, virtual private network technology was offered by Telco, uh, largely for load balancing be between uh, multiple uh, data center locations, uh, but by and large owned by the organization. Post.com bubble, we all spent significant amounts of time and energy in enterprise IT going through our portfolio of vendors and making sure that we were only making bets on technology providers that we thought were going to be around for the next 10 years. Uh, and this had significant impact. So a lot of the early investments, a lot of the cloud-like investments that had popped up uh, between 96, 97, and 2002, a lot of that died uh, an unfortunate and premature death as we went back to traditional IT post.com bubble. So let's talk about from 2002 to 2009. This was a very interesting uh, uh, time because we saw a couple of things. Number one, the rise of virtualization and the, and the consumerization of IT. Uh, now, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the one thing we know for absolute certain is that technology will continue to be disruptive. Um, and one of the things that we also know is the disruptor uh, will become the disrupted. Um, and, and we know that their, their technology advancements and virtualization is a great example um, that actually lead to more interesting things down the line. Uh, in this time frame, we saw virtualization rates grow from 5% uh, to about 25%. Now, that 25% may not seem like an impressive number, but when you think about the install base, that means a significant portion of the new server capacity that was going into organizations was being, was being virtualized. Uh, the second thing was the virtualization uh, density was increasing. In fact, in 2007, uh, we had this very interesting phenomenon. It was the crossover point. 2007 was the moment where there were more virtual instances than there were physical instances on the planet. 
Um, and so you, this, you may be asking yourself, what on earth does this have to do with cloud? Um, well, coupled with another trend, software as a service and bring your own device. Uh, at that same time, customers started getting more uh, willing to experiment either by requirement or necessity or opportunism with software as a service. And so they started getting comfortable with thinking about their applications living outside their four walls, big important applications with real meaningful data in it, that was living outside their four walls. And it was being accessed by devices that weren't necessarily always owned by enterprise IT. We saw the growth of co-location providers. Fewer and fewer customers were saying, I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm building my own data centers. More people were saying, I'm at least going to use shared source facilities. So what do all, all these trends have in common where customers overall were saying, I'm getting more and more comfortable not being physically connected with my IT. I'm moving instances around my organization to help uh, load balance my server capacity. I have meaningful applications that are being delivered software as a service by third parties in data centers that I don't even know about, accessed by devices that I don't own. Uh, IT was getting more and more comfortable with being disintermediated from that data. So what happened in 2009? The perfect storm. Um, I, we believe that there were actually a set of, of unrelated events in the period of about a year that hit a confluence that led to where we are today. Uh, number one, there were credible players in the market with credible offers. Um, this is very different than what we saw in the 98 to 2002 timeframe. There were starting to be vendors in this space that you were, as core IT, willing to bet on. I was willing to bet my core IT on a set of uh, folks in this space that were appealing. I felt like they were gonna stand the test of time or at least be willing to stand up for the next, the next 10 years. Next, the credit crisis. The credit crisis of 08, 09 actually had a significant impact because large IT organizations, even ones with incredibly solid balance sheets, suddenly couldn't buy servers. You couldn't get them. The majority of servers on the planet are actually leased, not bought. So even if you were a, a well-established business with a solid balance sheet, you couldn't necessarily borrow money. Uh, so that was interesting because given all the other trends that we saw, with compute continuing to go up, virtualization continuing to go up, the demand didn't slow down at all. Um, but I couldn't buy any more capacity. The rate of instance exploded even further. Not, over did, not only did it cross over, that trend line just kept going and going and going. Um, and so IT was left with this interesting quandary. Uh, I can't buy any more capacity. I'm getting more comfortable with being disintermediated from my data. I have virtualized, by and large. I'm moving applications to SaaS. Cloud starts to feel like not such a big deal. And this is the moment, this is the moment. 2009 was the moment where we actually saw very, very different uh, preference statements from customers. We started asking customers, do you prefer your data live inside your four walls? Most of them had gotten past the, all right, my payroll is outsourced. My CRM is outsourced. I'm using co-location providers. I couldn't even tell you where my server was if I had to. So they got more comfortable with it and they realized this is the next logical step. So where are we today, five years later? Um, what did we accomplish in the, in the last five years? Uh, uh, will help us a lot think about what we're gonna do in the, in the next five years. Well, since 2009, uh, we have actually focused uh, almost purely on replicating the IT environment in the cloud. And I'm not saying that there hasn't been a ton of innovation to make that real. I've got a whole bunch of engineers that you know, would tell us all sorts of interesting things about how much technology has been invented, not just us, but lots of companies across the planet. However, uh, by and large, IT organizations have told us very, very clearly they want their same environment that they have on premises in the cloud. So I, I think what this really was in the last five years was an economic shift. Sure, the technology changed some, but by and large, it was the next logical step. I went from physical, I went to virtual, and then I went directly to cloud. I was very comfortable with that. Um, and because of that, some of the early work by folks that sponsored virtualization technologies as a single source found themselves disrupted, right? Because technology didn't stop there. Virtualization largely paved the way to cloud by getting folks even more comfortable with moving instances around. 
we saw absolutely explosive growth. Uh, we continue to see uh, compute for uh, Azure double every six to eight months, and that's been true for the last 48 months. The last four years, we've doubled every six to eight months, and it continues. There is no sign of that letting off anytime soon. I have an entire team of capacity planning people that haven't had a good night's sleep in years, and there is no evidence that they will anytime soon. It is a great problem to have. Talk about first world problems, this is a great first world problem to have. Uh, but the amount of cloud capacity is just seemingly insatiable by how much demand customers are, are, are wanting. And part of it is not just lift and shift. We can talk endlessly about lift and shift, but the reality is the price of compute is getting so cheap, it's opening up lots of new possibilities for things that you can do with it that you just wouldn't have done before. We all agree that we're in a hybrid world. Even the folks that have the most aggressive views of the adoption of cloud overall, the most aggressive will tell you that by 2025, um, we're still gonna see about 40% of the IT assets on premises. So we all agree we're in this hybrid world, but different vendors have different points of view on what that means and how to take care of customers in that regard. Uh, we are starting to see the emergence of past and higher level services. I think this is gonna be a very important trend going forward, and I'll talk more about this on the, uh, uh, on the, next, on the next five years. I still, to this day, have not met a customer that's told me I really, really, really enjoy spending my nights and weekends patching servers. Haven't met one yet. There may be one out there, I haven't met them. Uh, so we, we do believe that over time we will continue to raise the abstraction layer higher and higher and higher. So as we think about the next five years, what I want to do uh, is to bring uh, Kareem Lakani up on stage. Uh, Kareem is a, uh, like I said, a, a professor at uh, Harvard. Uh, he's a well-cited expert in open source uh, and also in, uh, in crowdsourcing. Um, he's done a variety of work co-founding startups and contributing and giving back in terms of open source technology and helping people with business models. Uh, and we're going to get his viewpoint on economics in the next five years. Part of the, of the work that I've been doing at Harvard is to sort of look at uh, digital innovation and digital transformation. So what Stephen gave you an example of was what's happening on the supply side of technology, right? Prices are dropping, capabilities increasing. Um, but what's also very interesting is the demand side, right? So who would have guessed that a thermostat company would be worth $3 billion, right? Or a pizza company, Domino's, would be viewed as a technology firm, right? And what's going on is that more and more of our transactions that we engage in in the world, um, whether that be buying something, uh, connecting with somebody, um, are all being digitized. And as they get digitized, right, we can do more and more things with them. So why Nest got acquired for $3 billion beyond, beyond the nice interface was the fact that you can now do a whole range of data analytics on what energy demand is going to be. But that data has to be stored somewhere and be accessed somewhere and be analyzed somewhere. Similarly, Domino's thinks of themselves as a technology company that ends up serving pizza, right? But they get $2 billion in revenue from their digital sales and 40% is mobile, right? All this data about what customers are doing, how they're making their pizzas, Right? How when they actually make them online, they get the more fattier, more carb-loaded pizzas versus the ones when they call in and higher value ones uh, drives what, what happens with innovation. And so what we're seeing in the economy is lots of people rethinking what technology can do for them. And it's just not just about doing more fancier PowerPoints. It's really about re-architecting transactions and making transactions work for us. And so what Gordon Moore showed us 49 years ago was on the hardware side, in terms of cost reductions and increases in performance, we're now getting that coming through on the software side as well through cloud computing. And I think what's very interesting is that the costs for innovation are dropping dramatically. And so what used to be at the start of the first internet boom, uh, it would cost you about $10 million to do a startup, right? You raise $10 million, you'd need to buy a whole bunch of hardware, a whole bunch of engineers to do the work. Now, an average angel funding round is $300,000, okay? And the capacity you have with that $300,000 to go on the cloud and to do things that you weren't able to do five or 10 years ago is quite, quite amazing. The second thing um, 
that from a researcher point of view, I've been studying open source since 1998. Um, and when I started doing that, people were saying, this is a fad, just like cloud was, right? Open source, like who would want that? Um, and of course, now we sort of see that become a part of the software infrastructure. And for me, what's amazing is to see Microsoft offer Linux, right? That would never have happened a decade ago. Uh, and what's going on is that the levels of abstraction that are now available, we don't need to worry about what's running in our data center per se, what we want our capabilities, will make this debate even more interesting and will change the landscape where Microsoft will use open source technologies when it makes sense for them and contribute back to the public goods. And I think what will matter is going to be the value that people generate Right? how strong and robust the systems are and the service level agreements that you can get by going to uh, computation services on demand. Um, finally, I think what I want to show you is a view of the future. So what matters for us is not so much the bits and bytes and the gigabytes and the petabytes, that, those matter, but it's the applications, right? It's the demand side that matters. And what I've been studying over the last decade has been also the use of crowdsourcing, the use of contests to drive innovation in a range of settings. I'm doing a bunch of work with NASA where we take NASA's toughest technological problems in computation and get them solved through uh, online contests, but also with our medical school as well where the demand for computation is outstripping supply. And so let me just give you an example of, of what this looks like to, again, just remind you that it's not just about the technology, it's about the demand side. And what we're enabling through cloud computing is more innovative solutions to our, our society's problems. So um, as an example, uh, genomic information, genomic studies are creating data at levels that are just, some, just unprecedented. So we're going from petabytes of data to exabytes of data, and, the, and what's happening is that the life sciences community is now just drowning in data. Um, and they are faced with this big challenge, right? The best minds from MIT, Caltech, Harvard, Stanford, right? don't want to go work at the medical school or even at a pharma company. They want to go work at Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Twitter. Yet, we've got all this data. And who's going to analyze this data? So one of the things we've been doing on our side is to sort of say, just as cloud computing is making uh, the, the uh, computational power available on demand, crowdsourcing can make intellectual power available on demand and we can combine them together. So as an example, again, you see this crazy level of, of data that's being generated by various genomic studies. And we were then given a challenge at the Harvard Medical School to say, can we solve this problem somehow? Right? What if we can get access to the best minds to solve these computational problems? And what I'm showing you is a result of a study we did with the medical school where we were looking at immunogenomics and sequence alignment, which is a basic task in any kind of genomic study. And what we, were, what we did is we took this problem and we said, could we crowdsource a solution? And we used a platform called Top Coder and we ran a two-week uh, two contest. Uh, to get anybody in the world to participate with us to create a better solution than what existed um, in, the, in, the, in the academic community. Um, over two weeks, we had 700 people sign up and received 654 code submissions from 122 developers from around the world. They had access to our data set on a cloud computation site where we could basically give them the data set and they could go away, start working away on the solution. What we figured out was that we received 89 different approaches to solve the problem. And the participants, again, were from people that typically the medical school would never access. People came from Russia, France, Egypt, Belgium, and US. Imagine trying to get H1Bs for these guys, right? Really, really tough. Um, but we got great performance. And what you see on the graphic there are two dimensions of our performance metric. On the x-axis is a log scale of the time required to, see, uh, to, uh, to analyze 100,000 sequences. Right? And on the y-axis, we have the, how, how accurate this work was. And 0.8 is the theoretical maximum. The green dots represent the code submissions we got from our folks on this crowdsourcing platform, all right? The red dot represents the best solution from the NIH after millions of dollars of effort. And the yellow dot represents 
the solution from the Harvard Medical School and a researcher, a co-author on this paper, who had worked on this problem for 18 months with his own lab. So this should scare you, right? Because what we're doing now is that in two weeks' time, with cloud computing and crowdsourcing, we're blowing past the limitations that were in the data beforehand and in the analytics beforehand. And uh, the top left is where you want to be. And what's amazing to me is that once you can make this computational power available on demand, and once you can organize the world to work with you, we can just basically uh, just get past any thresholds that have existed beforehand. And so um, the amazing part here is that not a single person in this community of people that submitted code had any background in computational biology, right? They were just really good programmers, and we gave them a problem and a data set that could go after. So this is where we think the future is going, where more and more there's going to be demand for data, right? demand for innovative uses of data right? that has to be stored, stored analyzed, right? and then fed back. And what we'll be doing then is to be thinking about various ways in which we can rely on both cloud computation and intellectual power of the world to, to help solve these problems for us. So I've just given you a glimpse of the future. Stephen will go back and tell you more about, from a technology point of view, what happens. But I'm just going to just let you keep this in mind that in a range of settings in the economy, crowds and cloud are working together to do some amazing things. Thank you. Right, one of the things I want to underscore is the conversation that you mentioned on, on open source. Uh, open source, uh, cl the cloud has really changed the dialogue for a lot of folks, including Microsoft on open source. Uh, we are finding increasingly when we offer new services, particularly higher level services, that we're spending a lot less time with customers walking through the underpinnings. What's it built on? What's the operating system? It turns out customers don't care, particularly for higher level services. And here's the good news, we don't either. Right? The dialogue on open source has completely shifted to who wrote it, to how does it perform. Um, and as long as services continue to meet expectations uh, for their SLA, customers are happy to, uh, happy to adopt it. And that's very much led to a transformation in how we think about uh, using open source technology. And we're very proud of the work that we've done, we've done there. Uh, so let's shift gears and talk about the next five years. Um, again, go back to that, that mindset. Think about the disruptors and the disrupted. Uh, IT shows us over and over and over again what they prefer is the next logical step, right? The very, very, very next logical step happens over and over and over again. Um, in fact, you know, we, we, there's lots of models uh, you know, that, that help, us, help us reflect on this. And we made a bunch of investments you know, early on on higher level services. We spent a ton of money and in research into paths and ultimately customers are telling us that platform as a service and higher level services are clearly going to pay off. Again, going back to that example, I haven't met a customer that tells me they enjoy spending their nights and weekends patching servers or building infrastructure. Uh, one of the best examples that we think we have of this is the Olympics. Uh, NBC, uh, who we partnered with for, for, for the Olympics, uh, delivered uh, full broadcast, live and replay, for every event uh, in the Olympics to customers on any device, any device you wanted. Uh, could be a phone, could be an iPad, could be a PC, could be anything you want, live or on playback. We partnered with them, we serviced 100% of that load, zero downtime over the course of the Olympics. Did they deploy an operating system? No. They used higher level service, they used our media services to, 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 to do that. And I call that example out because I think it's important um, as we think about it, they used those higher level services and at the end of the Olympics, what did they do? They threw it all away. Right? Um, we can look at the use of this technology because of the price point, because of the ease of use, as being largely transient. Um, and we think this is super, super, super important. When you go back and you think about the investments that you made years ago and you were betting your IT organization on a stack, um, there were a few things that were really important. You thought about portability. You inspected all the way down because you thought you were opening a PO that might last for an incredibly long period of time. Um, as the services get higher level and easier and easier to use, you can think more about the transient nature 
uh, of those services, which brings us to the next theme for the next five years. Um, we uh, get ourselves confused in technology from time to time on this particular life cycle. Innovation, commoditization, standardization. Um, I think you can go back and look at a variety of trends, and I think we would all ultimately agree there could be some fierce debates along paths, uh, but ultimately you have to innovate then you commoditize, and then you standardize. When you attempt to standardize first, when you lock a group of people in a room and say, I want you uh, as vendors, as customers, as partners to get together and agree on a single implementation that we're all gonna use for years and years and years to come, the only thing I know for sure is that you're gonna stifle anything meaningful being accomplished for years, right? The best thing about cloud technology, in addition to the data, in addition to the access, is the market gets to decide. The market will pick winners and losers in this space, and we will continue to innovate. And the beauty, going back to that example from NBC, is this: you can start viewing more and more pieces of technology as being transient, as being pure utility. Use it for as long as it has value, and then throw it away and start over. And it's not that expensive. So the, the role that standards play in this is going to be very, very different going forward. Right? When you're making a technology bet, when you're opening a PO with a vendor that you think might be open for 10, 15 years, your portability is super important. When it's a short-term event, it's far less important, and so take advantage of those higher-level services and the innovation that's pouring out. Uh, next, the real security battle will be internal. Uh, I actually argue that it has been this way for a very long time, um, but we need to continue to remind ourselves. When we move information to the public cloud, this gives us this moment of pause. We think, oh, we need to focus even more about external security. And we've had long conversations with customers where we've built very sophisticated infrastructure with them with 256-bit encryption uh, to make sure that they were absolutely secured. Uh, however, what's the lesson from this guy? What is the lesson from this guy? The real lesson is that a contractor has access to everything you do. That a rogue employee of another company that you contract with can take anything they want. The real battle is internal, not external. Um, and so we ask you, I will implore you, uh, when you're thinking about spending money on security, make sure you're indexed in the right way. The battle is internal. Number four, innovation will continue to accelerate. We've got here, this is just uh, made us, uh, actually I'm gonna talk about each one of these in detail. I'm not really into that. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is just the innovation that's come out over the last 12 months. These are net new services that we've delivered in the last 12 months and it will continue to grow. Because we're using our own platform, we're using stuff that's available to us, some open source technology, some that we have built our own, the innovation cycle will continue to grow. Take advantage of it. Th think about this, if you wait for full commoditization and standardization, if you wait, the best you will ever be in your market is number two, right? Take advantage of those innovations, innovative services and think about this through a new lens. The old lens where we had to make long-term bets for a decade on pieces of critical technology. That's the old lens. The new lens is if it works, use it. And when it stops working or stops meeting our need, throw it away. Right? The switching cost is very, very, very different. When you went through those PO cycles for making application platform bets that you knew you were going to bet on forever, this is different. You can switch you can make technology shifts. Uh, I'm not saying that it's easy as, as flipping a switch, but it's not nearly what we all went through with the application platform days. Next, prices will continue to drop, uh, and they will get lower and lower and lower and lower. I, I think one of the interesting things or an exercise for you guys is when you're thinking about architecting a cloud-based application, uh, what would you do if compute, storage, and bandwidth were nearly free, if not free? How would you architect your applications differently? What would you do differently? Uh, we used to build applications that were uh, you know, very sensitive to how much memory they used, right? Because memory was expensive. Um, and so I wonder how much of the old lens do we have on, on how resource constrained are we as we think, think about that going forward. These things will continue to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. We have fierce competition. Right, which is a great thing. We have fierce competition with players that are really invested to win in this space, and you're gonna hear from a bunch of them over the next few days. This is great news for you guys as customers. It's great news. 
uh, it means that you're going to be able to get better technology with more innovation at lower price. The next one, the industry is going to consolidate. This is absolutely positively going to happen. It has to. The amount of money that we're talking about here is too big. And whether you read you know, one research firm or, or another, most people tend to think that we're going to coalesce around three large global providers. And then there's going to be a stack of providers that do things on top. But the number of folks on the planet that are, as a first priority, standing up physical hardware, that number will come down unless they're in, in, in niche markets. The reason for that is capital, commitment, and credibility. Uh, the capital involved to be a true global provider is uh, in the billions, if not tens of billions of dollars. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the folks in the, in the space, a, a competitor of ours, recently announced that they were investing $1.2 billion in data center build out. Sounds like a lot of money, right? $1.2 billion, about 60% of a Clippers team, right? Uh, big, a lot of money. Uh, well, uh, it, but if you kept reading, that was over 40 data centers. And so I, you know, I'm, I didn't go to Harvard, but um, I did some simple math. And that tells me it's about $30 million a data center. Not nearly enough. Not nearly, nearly, nearly enough. Tens of billions of dollars. It's what's going to be required to do this. Most of the data centers that we do are in the hundreds of millions of dollars for build out for single implementation. So that's on the capital side. Uh, on the commitment side, this is a space where we are deeply invested with our money and our practice to, to win. We, we, we feel like it's very important for us to take advantage um, of the opportunity that we have to help shift customers to cloud. Uh, in, in reality, you know, we have a firm investment both on the premises side and the cloud side. So you know, whether you want to stay on premises, you want to move into the cloud, we're glad to help talk to you about whatever makes the most economic sense for you in terms of taking, taking, advantage, of that, uh, taking advantage of that technology. Uh, and the third point on, on credibility. Uh, Going back, we, we know for sure disruptors will come in. Uh, the next set of disruptors may be uh, funded with $100,000 of VC, VC funding. Uh, and we know for sure that they, over time, will themselves become disrupted. Uh, so it's important to think about the long term here for uh, organizations that you think can stand the test of time. Uh, so as we move forward, there's a few things that I would uh, leave you with as we, as we wrap up. Uh, number one. Uh, as I like to tell folks, let the wild flowers bloom. Uh, there's plenty of, of value to be realized today. Uh, years ago when I would meet with customers and they'd say, hey, we're taking a slow wait and see approach with cloud. We're going to set up some governance bodies. We're going to study some different things and then we'll give guidance back to our, our, our corporation on what we should do. Uh, and then a year later they're saying, oh, wow, well that didn't work because all of my line of business managers went to the cloud without me. They did it, they just didn't tell me about it because um, they thought that they were going to be compliant. Um, you got to let the wildflowers bloom. It's going to happen with or without you, right? So encourage it, embrace it. Um, and not just on standard services, the typical way that you've done IT for years and years and years. Think about those higher level services. Take advantage of them. If it adds value and, adds econo and the economics are right, use it. Next thing, the disruptor of today is the disrupted of tomorrow. Bet on that. There is no such thing as, as a single piece of technology that is completely resilient over tens of decades. It just, won't, it just won't happen. Things evolve too quickly. And you have to make that bet that the innovator today that is doing amazing things will be the disrupted of tomorrow. And think about organizations that have been through multiple disruption cycles um, as you think about vendors in the space. Next. Re-index your investment on internal versus external security. This is one of those things, if you don't remember anything else about anything that we talked about this morning, remember that guy on the screen. And remember the real lesson here about contractors having access to everything you do. You know, one quick anecdote on that, the customers that we, we one particular one that we, you know, set up this 256-bit this encryption and we went through third-party security audits with them. Uh, I mean, this thing was, externally speaking, just completely, completely bulletproof. Um, and then we ran into trouble with a particular instance, and they wanted us to, to help diagnose what was going on. We said, yeah, sure, but you know, encrypt is not a lot we can do. We'll look at a few things. They said, oh, don't worry. And they emailed us their private key. <laughs> right? Thousands and thousands of hours of work, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars wasted, absolutely wasted. You might as well have just hid it in a file somewhere, right? Do security through obscurity when you're so thin. Um, as to have practices that are that poor. 
Um, and while we can laugh at that example, I bet you, uh, across organizations, if you really did an honest audit, left to right, about places where you had vulnerability, you'd find out that training was an area where you could continue to invest and get amazingly solid results on your, on your security. The last thing that I'll leave you with is, if you thought the last five years or even the last 10 years were interesting, wait for the next five, right? We have largely, I think, closed the chapter on what I'm gonna call the economic cloud, right? We've moved to the cloud, we've gotten great economic values. The next five years will be about technology. It'll be about even more disruptions. It'll be about startups with $100,000 of funding doing amazing things. I have an organization that showed up you know, a couple of years ago, pulled out their credit card, registered for an account that is now running over 10,000 cores simultaneously. Over 10,000, and that goes up and down. They've been as high as 50,000 cores for particular moments in time. And that will continue to happen over and over and over again. The level of abstraction is getting higher, the amount of resource that we're making available to customers is getting bigger, the prices are getting cheaper, the sky is the limit, um, as long as we continue to embrace these, uh, these themes. Uh, so I will leave you with that. Uh, we are in for an interesting ride. This will be an interesting space, uh, and I hope everybody is excited as we are about taking this journey over the next five years. Thank you very much.